So continuing to read from Matthew 25, um, a second parable, the parable of the three servants. Jesus is again talking to the disciples. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Once there was a man who was about to go on a journey. He called his servants and put them in charge of his property. He gave to each one according to his ability. To one he gave 5,000 gold coins, to another he gave 2,000, and to another he gave 1,000. Then he left on his journey. The servant who had received 5,000 coins went at once and invested his money and earned another 5,000. In the same way, the servant who had received 2,000 coins earned another 2,000. But the servant who had received 1,000 coins went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of these servants came back and settled accounts with them. The servant who had received 5,000 coins came in and handed over the other 5,000. You gave me 5,000 coins, sir, he said. Look, here's another 5,000 that I have earned. Well done, you good and faithful servant, said his master. You have been faithful in managing small amounts, so I'll put you in charge of large amounts. Come on in and share my happiness. Then the servant who had been given 2,000 coins came in and said, Look, you gave me 2,000 coins, sir. Look, here are another 2,000 that I have earned. Well done, you good and faithful servant, said the master. You've been faithful in managing small amounts, so I'll put you in charge of large amounts. Come on in and share my happiness. Then the servant who had received 1,000 coins came in and said, Sir, I know you are a hard man. You reap harvests where you do not sow, and you gather crops where you do not, where you did not scatter seed. I was afraid. So I went off and hid your money in the ground. Look, here is what belongs to you. You bad and lazy servant, his master said. You knew, did you? that I reap harvests where I did not sow and gather crops where I did not scatter seed? Well then, you should have deposited my money in the bank and I would have received it all back with interest when I returned. Now take the money away from him and give it to the one who has 10,000 coins. For to every person who has something, even more will be given and he will, and he will have more than enough. But the person who has nothing, even the little that he has, will be taken away from him. And as for this useless servant, throw him outside in the darkness, where he will cry and grind his teeth. So, um, an interesting lesson, not in financial in, uh, investment, but in the use of God's great gifts. The pivot of this story, the most important point in some ways, is that opening line that says, that the master gave to the servants according to his ability. So the one who we focus on, the one who didn't earn a lot of extra money for his master, is the one who's given the least amount of money. So the master had recognised that here was someone who wasn't necessarily going to be able to do an enormous amount, but he was still entrusted with great riches. You know, that's a lot of money. And he was given all of this, and the master went away. And what did he do? He said he was afraid of what would happen, afraid of the consequences, afraid of failure. And so he did nothing. He took what he had been given and he buried it, hid it out of sight, totally ignored it, forgot he even had it. Although I'm sure he didn't. It must have lived as some sort of thorn in his side every day, thinking, mm, cranky, eventually the master's going to come back. Oh, and he'll want it back. But at least he'll get everything back. I haven't defrauded him. But this is where the financial lesson ends and spiritual, spiritual discipleship takes over. Because God has entrusted into all of our hearts, if we know God, if we've somehow allowed God to enter our hearts and minds, we know of the enormous debt of love that we owe to God. For God found us before we certainly could possibly ever deserve it, and found us often before we even knew of God, and has placed in our hearts a gift of tremendous love, peace, joy, and assurance. 
God's grace, as we call it, that jargon word that means God's love coming to us freely, unbidden and unwarranted. God's love has come to us. It's been given to us. It's in our hearts. It's in our minds. It fills us with that love, joy and peace and strength. And it calls us to do something with it. It calls us to be active, to be diligent, to be energetic in our service of God. Not simply to survive, not simply like that last servant, to sit in whatever comfort we have and know that we have this great gift, but that it sits there doing nothing. That it is simply a possession. It is simply an amount of joy sitting in the corner, which we can look at, but we never take it out and use it. The other two um, uh, servants took the money and they actively did things with it. And because of what they did, a bit like the parable of the sower, so much more was generated. They took what they'd been given and they created more. And so it is with Christian disciples. We are called to be very active with the love we've been given so that it generates more love, more kindness, more awareness of God's grace. The key here is to be those who not only understand how blessed they are, but to be those who are really active in their service. And many will know that actually it's only when you do take God's love and give it to other people and change your words and your actions in the light of what you know about God, that these things grow. As you take risks for God, your knowledge of God's assurance and God's strength grows you understand that you can be more dependent on God than ever when you use God's love. You can really understand how that gift is something which isn't static. It is dynamic and it does increase in value because if you can take the love that's in your heart and share it with another person and they too can come into that awareness, then that is an amazing growth and that is a tremendous transformation, born again in new ways. So the calling here is to the disciples to be active and diligent, not just to bask in the light of this wonderful gift of love. And that's something that's really important in these times of lockdown and the denial of what we have come to expect as church life. So we can't gather together in our buildings we can't be together physically, we can't hug, we can't embrace, we can't talk in great numbers. And that physical connection isn't there. But what is there still? Maybe the most important thing that was always there. Ourselves and our own unique relationship with God. And the call to say, what is it that we, according to our abilities, what is it that we individually can do to take the love that we found and to make more from it? To invest it wisely in places where it will grow. So much of this is like the parable of the sower, isn't it? To be faithful stewards not people who keep things under lock and key but instead take that gift out into the world and make more from it this is what god calls us to be and there is no passive sense of christian discipleship one should always be on the lookout for opportunities to share that love with others and for opportunities to speak of God and to use what we've been given. We ourselves are that seed, aren't we? There is almost a need to recognise places where we can plant ourselves, where we can grow and where we can benefit other people.
This is possibly the key, isn't it? To think of where we need to sow ourselves, not what we grow just in other people, so that God's kingdom may flourish and that brothers and sisters everywhere may know the central truth that they are loved by the God who made all things. What is it that we should be doing? Where is it that we should be going? What is it that we should be doing to further God's kingdom? For the gifts that we've been given are too good to keep to ourselves. They are God's love, and that is tremendous. <laughs>